Hi guys, it's Colin from the Oz Connection. Welcome today and happy Halloween everybody. I'm joined by my good friend and Eisner Award winner illustrator and author Eric Shanoa. Hey Eric. Hi Colin. Happy Halloween to you too. I'm glad to be here. Well we're filming this on the 19th of October but for you guys you'll be seeing this on the 31st of October. Special Wicked Witch of Oz different versions um, discussion with Eric. So, Eric, are you go, have you guys been doing anything for Halloween? Uh, I, we don't have any plans yet. I assume we'll buy candy to give out to kids. We usually don't get that many, maybe like 30 or 40. Um, but I don't know what it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like this year with COVID. Yeah, over like, here. When everybody's wearing masks, everybody will be wearing masks, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll get some comedy masks as well for Halloween, people at the door. Over here, most people have given up on trick-or-treating this year. Yeah. So, Eric, you've had a lot of work in Oz since the 80s, right up to an almost current day now as an illustrator and an author. So you've illustrated your own comic books in the 80s as part of the Adventures in Oz series. You illustrated for uh, Rachel Cosgrove Page's second Oz book, The Wicked Witch of Oz, in 1993. Um, you've also illustrated for Eloise McGrath, John R. Neal, and even L. Frank Baum. So do you like Oz then, I take it? Well, you know, it's sort of taken over my life. I, couldn't, I can't really help it anymore. Uh, I've been an Oz fan ever since I was six years old and saw the, the Judy Garland MGM movie adaptation on TV. Mm -hmm. And I, shortly after that, I discovered the Oz books and... That was sort of um, the beginning of a never-ending hobby, I guess, if you want to call it a hobby. I mean, I, I love the Oz books, but it's also taken over my career as well. Uh, when I first began, started to be started as a professional cartoonist, I, as I said, I had a series of, of Oz graphic novels mm -hmm. that later got titled Adventures in Oz. Uh, when I finished that, I decided I wasn't going to do any Oz projects anymore that I had had my fill, but I keep doing more. They keep coming along. I always have some Oz project of some sort or other up probably every moment of my life. Um, some of yeah. them. Yeah, only a now really is going to be death then. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I've, I've become reconciled to that. It's fine. I still like <laughs> Oz and I'm still finding Oz projects that are really exciting to work on. Oh, great. Anything coming up? Currently, I have a couple things in the works. One of them is uh, a three-book deal. Um, I, in 2014, I produced a revival of the TikTok Man of Oz at an Oz convention. And I'm ever since then, I've been planning on publishing my version of the script and the score for performance purposes. Okay. And I'm going to be doing that. Uh, so the script is one book, the score is another book, and then I also wrote an article at the time, and I've uh, greatly expanded that article on the history of the show, uh, and that'll be a book of its own with a lot of photos and images uh, detailing the whole history of L. Frank Baum's uh, show, musical uh, show, The TikTok Man of Oz from 1913. Oh, great. I mean, I was there in San Diego back in 2014. It was a great, fun show. And I know you put a lot of work into it. So I'm sure I and others are going to really look forward to reading that and picking that up when it comes out. Any ideas when we'll be seeing that? I By next, next summer, I think it'll be out. Oh, great. Cool. So one of the things I thought would be fun today was to talk about you're particularly first off The Wicked Witch of Oz from 1993, published by the International Wizard of Oz Club. Uh, I also believe your first book to illustrate for one of the Royal Historians of Oz. Is that right? Well, it's the first new book that I illustrated by an Oz author. Uh, I had done illustrations, new illustrations for L. Frank Baum's he had written, he wrote a series of short stories as comics pages in 1904 and 05 called Queer Visitors from the Marvelous Land of Oz. And I was hired to re-illustrate those in 1985, 86 um, as- For the third uh, book of Oz. 
yeah, it was called the third book of Oz because it was supposedly chronologically after the first two Oz books. And that's been republished uh, once, at least once. But uh, The Wicked Witch of Oz was the first unpublished Oz manuscript by a, a royal historian of Oz, as we call them, uh, that I illustrated. I was really, really happy to work on that. How did that um, come about then? Uh, the Oz Club had published several uh, books, Oz books, by the Royal Historians of Oz, the people who succeeded L. Frank Baum in writing the Oz series. They'd done a couple by Ruth Plumley Thompson and then one by Eloise McGraw and, and uh, Lauren McGraw. Uh, Dick Martin had illustrated those. Dick Martin died in February 1990, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And so Fred Meyer, the at that time secretary of the International Wizard of Oz Club, had been had contacted Rachel Cosgrove Pays. Uh, everyone knew that she had written a second manuscript for an Oz book after her first one, Hidden Valley of Oz, was published in 1951, I think. But Riley and Lee, the Oz publishers, had rejected it. It was called The Wicked Witch of Oz. She had later retitled it to Percy in Oz. Mm -hmm. uh, Percy is the giant white rat, white lab rat that she introduced in Hidden Valley of Oz. So uh, she was all for the book being published. You know, they, the Oz Club was going to give her money. She was a professional author. And, you know, it's, that's what, that was her business, selling her writing. She had, got, she had been... Uh, famously annoyed by Oz fans previous to this, uh, including by she found Fred Meyer particularly annoying because they kept asking her, can we see the manuscript? Can you send us a copy? Um, why did you write this way? Why did you write that way? And she was, she had no patience for um, analysis like that. She, or people begging to see things that she had done. She was willing to have it published if they were gonna pay her, but she wasn't just gonna uh, turn over her work for just because someone was a fan. Mm -hmm. uh, her, her line was, Oz is for kids. And she would say that with some vehemence. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first time I asked Fred Meyer about her, um, this was like eight, 10 years before Wicked Witch happened. And he did not speak very complimentary of her. But then suddenly um, he was in negotiations with her to publish The Wicked Witch of Oz and everything was copacetic. So uh, Fred called me, it was after Dick had died, maybe a few months after Dick had died. Um, and he said, he said, well, Dick Martin is gone. So we need someone to illustrate new Oz books. Or would you be interested? Of course, I was really enthusiastic and really happy to be asked. He, ha he mentioned Rob Roy McVeigh as a possible illustrator, but I was just like, no, 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 don't ask Rob. I want to do it. <laughs> I didn't say that out loud. I was just like, let it, don't talk, just don't mention that he's asked me. So we're going to, I'll do it. That was 1990. That was Rachel's, Rachel went to an Oz convention. Mm -hmm. um, one of the Oz conventions was called the Munchkin Convention at the time. That was the East Coast one. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel lived in New Jersey. The convention was in Wilmington, Delaware, it's just a few hours from where she lives. So she and her husband drove down. Uh, I, I went to meet her and hit it off with her. Um, she was a really fun person, uh, really no nonsense, uh, just would tell it like it is, not afraid to talk, uh, you know, be a little rough. She'd give her opinions about people and she was thoroughly delightful. My kind of woman. Not like Fred Meyer <laughs> indicated then. <laughs> yeah, kind of. She was a little like you, Colin. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Just fortunately, she could. She was much better at grammar than I was. <laughs> yeah. So um, then I went home from the convention and expected to start pretty soon on this book. Mm -hmm. uh, but who was the special publications director of the Oz Club at the time? It was. 
Michael Patrick Hearn had been till recently, or maybe he still was. Anyway, I remember writing him a letter. We still had letters. We still wrote letters in those days. Uh -huh. um, and I said, okay, when is this book going to start and what's going on? Can you send me a contract? Blah, blah, blah. He wrote back and he said, nothing's been decided yet. Don't jump the gun. Um, Fred Meyer has offered you money, but that doesn't mean the Oz Club is going to go along with this project. So, I mean, it was typical Oz Club kerfuffle where no one knows what the other person is doing and it's just a bunch of, of incredible confusion. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know that was how that was how Fred Meyer worked. He was just like it. I'm the secretary. He basically ran the club. Whatever he wanted to do, he did. Yeah. If someone didn't want to go along with him, he put up a huge fuss. He was generally a nice man. I'm not trying to speak badly of him, mm -hmm. but he, he was an Oz fan, and what he wanted, what he his view of Oz was what the Oz Club was, and what he wanted went. Uh, so this. Michael, Michael Patrick Hearn letter was sort of abrupt and unfriendly. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I think Michael Patrick Hearn then got kicked out as special publications director. Mm -hmm. uh, he had published some books for the Oz Club that everyone else was not happy that he did. Uh, and Mark Lewis became the director of special publications for the Oz Club. And so I was working with him. I'd known Mark for years, mm -hmm. but it still didn't happen. It was like going on and on. I'm like, when is this going to happen? Is this ever going to happen? Meanwhile, you know, I had to take other work on. Mm -hmm. I'm not like waiting around for this Oz book that's never happening. I became, I found out that the Oz Club was going to reprint Rachel's first Oz book, Hidden Valley of Oz. Mm -hmm. And the illustrator for that book, Dirk Gringus, his work in that book is famous among Oz fans for being pretty uniformly ugly. Oh yeah. So I thought, Oh, well, if the Oz Club's going to reprint this book, why don't we do it as, uh, in a, as in a new version, in a much prettier version? So I volunteer. I didn't volunteer. I mean, I wanted to get paid, but my I didn't ask for a very high fee uh, to re-illustrate Hidden Valley of Oz. And I said, well, you know, you don't even have to re-typeset the book. We'll just cut out Dirk's illustrations and the spaces where he did illustrations, I will do illustrations. Mm -hmm. So you just have to cut, you know, cut my illustrations, put them in. You don't even have to do any re new layout. I did a few samples, sent in my proposal. And this was still when Hearn was in charge. And maybe this was the letter that I got back from him. Uh, he said that they weren't interested, that they wanted to do a facsimile of the original version, which is a reasonable, reasonable approach. It's just also the ugly approach. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, whatever, I don't know whether uh, many what? else, you mean to tell me now at many else conventions where I've said to you, why don't you illustrate the hidden Valley of Oz? There was an actual small glimmer of an opportunity there to, to do that and replace Gringus's work. Yes, there was an opportunity and I was, um, cutting my rate radically to let the Oz club do it. And they said, no, so whatever. <laughs> Uh, but Rookie Witch was still on the drawing, on the schedule. It was going to happen. Finally, finally, what? It was um, summer of 92. 92? Was it that long? From 90 to 92, it took, long, it took a long time. <laughs> finally, I got the go ahead to go to illustrate. I mean, we had, we got all the contracts signed um, and I did the work. Uh, and my determination was to make it the most beautiful Oz book anyone had ever seen, at least to the, the best of my ability. There was not gonna be any color in it. Well, there was for the special edition and there was obviously the dust jacket was in color. There wasn't any color work, but I wanted to make it really as beautiful as I possibly could. So it took, it was a lot of effort. Um, Dick Martin had famously in this small Oz niche, mm -hmm. uh, asked for the Oz books, he illustrated for the Oz Club to be very large books so that you could fit lots of type on a page and he would have to do as few illustrations as possible, but still make it look like it was sumptuously illustrated. 
in fact, the second Oz book he illustrated for the Oz Club, he did this one illustration, the cover illustration, and it was in pieces. Mm -hmm. And for the interior, half the, almost half the illustrations he did are just pieces of the cover reprinted <laughs> as vignettes in the book. So you have to do very little work. We're talking the big white paperback editions that came out that, that I hate yes. and got the hardback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, actually, the first one had a hardback, hardcover edition too. Um, so, but I was like, no, why do, for Wicked Witch, we're not going to do this ugly, ugly uh, format that everyone actually hates except Dick Martin. Um, we're going to make it look like a real Oz book, a regular Oz book. Um, so standard Oz book sizes weren't the same for most uh, printers anymore, but what the standard Oz book size is now pretty much, whoever wants to do a traditional Oz book does it that size, the size we did Wicked Witch. I'm sorry, what's what's next? <laughs> Your uh, next question? I was just trying to tell the story here. Okay. <laughs> so talking about Wicked Witch, so pretty much, I think that segues nicely into how you approached in terms of detail. So I'm kind of interested how you approach Singra, the Wicked Witch of the South. Um, yes. Also, not your first time um, drawing a Wicked Witch of the South. You did so in the Secret Apples of Oz. In Enchanted Apples of Oz. Apple, sorry. That's okay. No one can get that title right. <laughs> I obviously picked the wrong title for that book because everyone always gets it wrong. And it's, I just should have called it the Golden Apples. That's it's what most so everyone. It's so much Enchanted that no one can even say the title, Eric. <laughs> I'm assuming not the same witch then. Um, it is not the same witch. The Wicked Witch of the South in Enchanted Apples of Oz was just my my invention of a witch. Mm -hmm. There had not been a, a Wicked Witch of the South in the Oz books um, until that time. And that seemed like a, a little bit of a hole, so I, I made one up. Other people have made one up. Obviously, Rachel Cosgrove Pays had made one up in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Her book just didn't get published for more than 40 years. But when I got to Wicked Witch of Oz, I had to like illustrate a new Wicked Witch of the South. Uh, whatever, you know, it's that's a job. That's an illustration job. And I didn't have to answer the question of how come there were two Wicked Witches of the South. Mm -hmm. uh, you I'm know, pe people can take whatever ever view of continuity and canon and whatever about the Ozbooks that they want. Mm -hmm. and reject one witch or accept the other or accept them both. My explanation is they are sisters. They hate each other. <laughs> they do not acknowledge that the other one exists. They will not speak to each other. Um, and they um, pretend that they're the only one and they've both taken the title, the Wicked Witch of the South. Um, they're like other famous sisters who hate each other, like um, Ann Landers and Abby Van Buren, the two um, newspaper advice columnists who both have these advice columns. If they hate each other, pretend each other doesn't exist. Um, or Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine, who are sisters. They're both actresses, they, but they don't acknowledge that the other person exists. Um, I, may be, I may be overstating those things about the real people. I don't know. Don't sue me. But um, my I, my concept of the two wicked witches of the south, wicked witches of the south, is based on that model. Well, for me, that is now canon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, I did notice that they're both asleep, so there were. The, it's also there must be some kind of sleep apnea or sleep problem in the family, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird. Uh, those both these witches were like asleep, put into enchanted sleep for long periods of time. Um, and these, both those ideas were come up, we came up with those ideas completely independently of each other, knowing nothing of the other person's idea. It's just this weird coincidence. And that's why I think like Dear Abby and Ann Landers are, or Joan Fontaine and Olivia de Havilland are these perfect models because they both have the same, the, all of these uh, details about their lives are very, very similar. I mean, I guess it's the, their careers in those cases. Um, in this case, it's these sleeping witches. I, I guess also being a book series that was reaching 80, 90 years old at that point, it's also a good way of explaining why these witches haven't really been around for the last 200 years or so. Yeah. yeah. So 
for the for Singra then the Wicked Witch of the West. So for me, looking at your illustration, south. sorry, Wicked Witch of the South, for your <laughs> illustrations, they're very much a more than a love letter to John Arneal's illustrations, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I Put your own spin on it. I uh let's see. Um at the time I was also editor of the Oz calendar. The, I was the art director for the Oz calendar for the Oz club. So um, I was doing an Oz, a John R. Neal Oz calendar. And I was going through all, all this magazine work of his that had been published uh, and doing, what I had to do was uh, photocopy stuff out of magazines. And then I was reprinting it as mm -hmm. images in the calendar for each month. And some of it wasn't in really good condition anymore. I had to get, first it was printed, which wasn't always the best. And then I had to photocopy it, which wasn't all the best. And then we had to shoot the calendar from, from my paste ups of, of these photocopies. But sometimes the lines would just be in terrible condition. So I had to do a lot of restoration. So I'd be like drawing these John R. Neal lines on this artwork. Um, I hope no one could tell that I did a lot of restoration on it, but I did. And so I was like in this John Arneal mood and uh, I had bought Drawing with Pen and Ink, which was in a book that John Arneal had a few illustrations in, a classic uh, sort of book on how to draw with pen and ink. Mm -hmm. um, the current or the this was a first edition and uh, the later editions eliminated a lot of his work, but in the first edition has four or five really, really beautiful John Arneal pieces in it. Mm -hmm. But John Arneal is not the only illustrator that I love. So um, I was trying to emulate this sort of classic pen and ink technique from the golden age of American illustration. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that's what I did in Wicked Witch of Oz, try to capture the feeling of this old time pen and ink illustration work with lots of detail, lots of cross hatching, mm -hmm. lots of light and dark effects. I think particularly in Singra, you, your line art is very beautiful and detailed and would align to that. So where the other Oz characters are very Neil-esque and Singra particularly has even more of your own stamp on it and, and a wonderful level of detail, particularly in the first few chapters when you're in her house. Yeah, there's so much level of detail. I couldn't sustain that sort of technique in drawing for, for more than one book. Uh, I remember when I did Runaway in Oz a few a year or two later, mm -hmm. um, Peter Glassman, who is the publisher, said to me, well, we'd like you to do uh, a similar job to the, what you did with Wicked Witch of Oz. And I just said, uh, look, I will do a good job. I'll do the best job I can for this book, but I cannot do that level of intense illustrative work anymore. Um, it was just a huge, huge project for me. I did that for Wicked Witch because it was the first new Oz book by a royal historian of Oz that I had illustrated. I didn't know I was gonna be doing more. I thought it was gonna be the only one I ever did in my life. So I pulled out all the stops that I possibly could and did as elaborate and terrific a job as I possibly could. Oh, you did so, a job as well. No, no, I don't have any uh, bad feelings toward later Oz projects that I've done, which weren't quite as detailed because every project I do, I try to do the best job I can. But um, later Oz, Oz projects have not had that technique applied to them. I think it's particularly, it stands out as well on Percy. So your version of Percy which is the uh, lab rat friend in the um, Cosgrove Oz books. Very different to Gringus, much more lifelike. Thank you. Very beautiful illustration at the beginning, which you know from conversations, one of my favorites, where Percy, and I'll post it on screen over this video, where Percy is lying there with his paw prints scattered all around the page. You know, very, very detailed lifelike work, complete opposite of Gringus. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dirk Gringus, his version of Percy lo looks like a uh, retarded guinea pig. Um, <laughs> it's, 
it's really, 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 uh, why? Um, so I was determined to draw Percy in a much more uh, friendly, approachable way. Uh, people have, Oz fans have over the years really, really um, shown their disgust over the idea of a giant lab rat being an Oz character. They just can't get over the idea of a talking rat who's like five and a half feet high. <laughs> I never so, had a problem with Percy. I, I, I don't know if because I read it as I was older and I read Wiki Witch first. I don't know. I never had a problem. Well, that was my part of my idea was I need to make Percy personable. I need to make him something that people are going to accept better. I want him to be a, a little more friendly, cuddly, not necessarily cuddly, but mm -hmm. You know, not this repellent, horrible piece of <laughs> yuck that, that Dirk had drawn. How does um, it work out that then? Because Percy is particularly lifelike, but um, cute. And well, I bought, a, I bought a real rat at the pet store. I bought a white rat and named the rat, rat Percy, and that was my model for, the, for, the draw, for a lot of the artwork. The drawing that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, was came from a sketch that I had made of Percy when he was asleep in his cage and I just sketched him and I'm like, oh, I could use this for something. I'll use it for the title page. Well, I'm glad as uh, it was the night as you didn't drug him for that shot then. At least he was asleep in his cage. Yeah, oh no, I didn't drug the, the rat at all. Uh, I would feed him carrots and piece, take a piece of carrot and like try to get it so that he was in a position, you know, eating the, nibbling the carrot in a position that I needed for uh, an illustration. <laughs> um, That's great. I also used photos of rats too uh, for the illustrate for reference for the illust for illustrations, but um, I, Percy was my rat for for a while. He lasted while well, the illustrations for the book lasted. Um, he unfortunately died soon after the book was over not through any of anything that i deliberately did to him just because as long as you fed him, gave him a loved life i'm sure he was fine and um, yeah it was i don't i had no idea how much work a rat was i had to change his his bedding every single day um because the cage was i don't know you know like that big and um he had this bedding and he would poop in it. And so I had to change it every day. Every morning I had to go out, take him out. I would take him out of the cage and let him run around, run around the kitchen and uh, have to rip up newspaper for new bedding. So what did you have to do for the model of um, a singer then? Did she live in the spare room? Did you have to feed her and clean her bed sheets? I did. No. <laughs> and she only lasted uh, <laughs> while the book was on too. And then I killed her. No. Um, you know later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, she's not a, she's not based on anybody real. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, she's very different she's, looking to say versions of the Wiki Witch of the West or Mombi as well. So she's got a very unique look to her compared to the other witches out there. Of course, you know, she had to be her own witch, and mm -hmm. I had to make her as striking as possible which is what my intention was. Kind of uh, essentially warty and bubbly, and then that comes over into her clove wear as well. From, from yeah. my, that's my interpretation of it. Well, why, yeah, I made her clothes really ragged. Why did I do that? I guess it's because, uh, well, she's been asleep for a hundred years or whatever. Yeah, a mm -hmm. hundred years. And all the moths have gotten into her clothing. So she doesn't have anything new to wear. So she has to wear all this old ratty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, she's really ugly because she's a witch. Um, Rachel wanted her to be really ugly, really witchy. She goes, I want this to be the witchiest witch that was ever a witch. Uh, so I tried to come up with the witchiest witch I could possibly do. Um, obviously, these are, these, obviously, these are fairy tale witches, and I'm not trying to insult, degrade, or offend any <laughs> actual real life Wiccans. Um, so, so did you have much more of a say in other than the Wiki Witch of what she would like to see in how you stylized her book? 
No, she didn't give me any particular. She just said, you know, she has to be really witchy and she has to wear red. Um, obviously, we only had a few color images. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really happy with the purplish cast that some of the clothing got. Mm -hmm. uh, I would redo that now. I'd make that a little more, little redder. Mm -hmm. It's with her being from the Quadling South, essentially. Yes, she's from the red, red country of Oz, the Quadling country. So she had to wear red. That's cool. I think probably it's a nice point to maybe say. No, it's not the only other witch. So we've already talked about the other witch of the South that you've illustrated, and I think you've already given a good critique of how they, how where they, where they're from. You've also drawn Mombi in the Paradox of Oz, Edward yeah. Einhorn's book. Here's a painting of Mombi that I did a couple of years ago. That's unpublished. I was going to say I've not seen that in Paradox. Uh, again, line art. Do you, obviously very much leans towards Neil's style of Mombi with your own detail and take on that character. Um, sure. Well, John, Ar I mean, the Oz books, I read the Oz books with the illustrations by John R. Neil, and that's those illustrations form my concepts of the characters. Mm -hmm. So that's who I take as my char character designs when I draw the same characters. I take, ne I start with Neil's work and use those as a basis for my character designs because those are define the characters for me um, when it comes to the Oz books uh, W.W. Denslow mm -hmm. defined those characters but for me John R. Neal defined the Oz characters much more and what Neil drew is what the what the characters look like no matter if the text contradicts them Mm -hmm. or if Denslow's earlier illustrations don't look quite the same. But whatever John R. Neal drew is what goes, because that's what the Oz books are to yeah. me. I get that. It's very much, in my head, similar um, in terms of what I would envision. And I don't know a lot of other big Oz fans would, would think similarly, and we appreciate that you continue that legacy of the Neil esque illustrations but i also think with mombi as well you get to give another take on mombi in that book as there's, there's almost a good and bad mombi in that particular book without giving away all the storyline so you kind of do much a much more softer granny like mombi as well using neil's original style sure and then yeah, uh, they go to another the characters go to an alternate version of oz where the people who in the regular Oz are good, then in the, this other Oz are evil. And the people who are evil in the Oz we know uh -huh. are, are the opposite in the other Oz. So I call it evil Oz, although that isn't uh, what it's called in the book, but I was co-editor on the book. So when Edward was writing it, we had to call it something. Um, so I just started calling it evil Oz. That's cool. The, uh, you also, I think, if I remember right, you do do an illustration of the Wicked Witch of the East in that book as well. Um, I think there's only one illustration, which would, I'm assuming is totally your own style there, because I don't remember Denslow doing the Wicked Witch of the East. Neil may Yeah, have Denslow drew her feet. Um, <laughs> and uh, Neil did one... Oh, Neil did a couple illustrations of the Wicked Witch of the East, East for TikTok... I'm sorry, the Tin Woodman Man, Tin Woodman of Oz. Yeah. Um, there's one color plate and then one black and white illustration, and they basically don't look very similar. So, and it's just sort of the sort of generic old old fairy tale woman mm -hmm. that Neil drew in it. So, it's not very distinctive. I mean, I looked at them and I took a little bit from them. I think I tried to exaggerate Neil's look. Mm -hmm. to make her more distinctive but i've drawn several different wicked witches of the east through the years and they all look a little bit different my favorite one is i do a cover for oziana which is the fiction magazine of the international wizard of oz club where they publish amateur uh oz story new amateur oz stories and i've done some illustrations for various issues over the years. 
Oh. And I drew a cover of the house about to land on the Wicked Witch of the East. So that's sort of my my uh, main take on her. That's what she looks like to me. I don't believe I've seen that, actually. Well, Colin, you're just not prepared for this interview, are you? <laughs> I can remember some <laughs> some details of books that I've read over the years, but I've not, I must confess, I'd never actually had the Oziana books. That's probably why. That's the only reason. Uh, well, you I know. Can, um, I can obsessively talk details of at least Paradox of ours. Okay. And, and, the, and the Wicked Witch of ours. So, you know, give me, give me a little bit of, a bit of kudos for that. <laughs> Colin, you failed me. <laughs> what is that t-shirt you're wearing with Mickey Mouse with red eyes? It's the Mickey Mouse Pride. Oh, it's a it's a rainbow. Yeah. It was from with it was just sort of Mickey Mouse peeking up um, <laughs> over the edge of the, uh, the the frame of the camera, and I could see like these red eyes. It's like what what is that? You're wearing that for Halloween because this is like some sort of scary version of Mickey Mouse, but I guess it's not. I guess I need one now after that. Um, you've also drawn the Wiki Witch of the West, or kind of almost the Wiki Witch of the West, in the Living House of Oz, or Edward Einhorn's sequel. Um, tell us a little bit about that, because that's again a different style. That's more of a Denslow style, thing, right? Well, yeah. Well, Denslow established the look of the Wicked Witch of the West because he illustrated the first Oz book, The Wizard of Oz, and that's where the character appears. Um, so even though she's kind of really funny looking with th these three pigtails and this giant tall hat and um, very different from the sort of popular image of Margaret Hamilton as the Wicked Witch of the West. Oh, yeah, totally. That is, the, is what the Wicked Witch of the West in real Oz looks like, um, at least in my opinion. And certainly, again, you, you get to do a more kindly version because the one in this book isn't really wicked, is she? Even if she looks like that, that character. Yeah, well, she's she's the she's the wicked witch of of the West from a different dimension. So, so from an alternate Oz, so she's a different person, mm -hmm. and she basically looks the same, but her personality is completely different. She's not a wicked witch. So I had to um, have her personality inform how she looks. So she still has these three pigtails and an eye patch and um, her clothing has some reminiscent details of Denslow's witch, but it is different mm -hmm. because she's a different person. Yeah. So I had, but I had to make her, you know, her expressions, who she was, uh, look more like the character who is, um, not particularly wicked. She's a very uh, confident, firm person who is going to do what she wants to do, what she thinks is right, and not let anybody tell her if she is in disagreement, not anybody tell her what to do if she's in disagreement with somebody else's mm -hmm. uh, ideas, such as Ozma. So she and Ozma get into conflict and actually, um, well, I won't tell you the end of the story for all of those who haven't we'll read the have book to yet. Go to hungrytigerpress.com, which I'll post a link down below and find out for yourself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I really liked about that take is in Denslow's version of the Wiki Witch of the West, I think there's maybe like two, three illustrations in the wonderful Wizard of Oz. We get mm -hmm. to see different, much more different angles of, of that particular style because she's a main kind of character in that book. I, don't, I disagree. She's certainly not a main character. She's just one episode in a very episodic story. I think we get more than three illustrations of her. You have to get, go back to the first edition to get everything. Yeah, I think um, it's the main character what I was referring to as Mordra in the Living House of Oz, whereas the Wiki Witch of the West, so you see more of Mordra as that style of character is what I was referring oh, to. Oh, yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Yeah. Mordra in the Living House of Oz is a very central character. She's not the main character. Her, her son is the main character. Um, but Mordra's in a lot because yep. she is in conflict with Ozma. 
Yeah, and it, it's a good conflict and a good resolution to that conflict. Yeah. Um, anyone who's titillated by that will have to purchase the book. So do you, was there any other witches then that you've illustrated? Then are the only ones off the top of my head, and I've got quite a fair bit of your collection. Um, well, I've illustrated a lot of good witches. Um, one of my graphic novels was called The Blue Witch of Oz, so mm -hmm. I came up with The Good Witch of the East, since that was another hole in mm -hmm. um, what Baum and Thompson, Ruth Pelmy Thompson, had written in the Oz books. Of course, I've illustrated Galinda, mm -hmm. although she was actually only called a witch in The Wizard of Oz. She became a sorceress then, thereafter, but we still consider her the Good Witch of the South. I've certainly seen um, I've, drawn the Good Witch of the North at the very least in um, shots of lots of Oz characters from memory. Yeah, and um, uh, the Good Witch of the West is Gloma, and I've drawn her a few times in sort of different uh, different aspects. Uh, she's the Black Witch, and in the book that she was introduced in Wishing Horse of Oz, mm -hmm. she looks like, uh, um, you know, like a person of European descent. Mm -hmm. She does not have black skin. So, I mean, obviously, the Oz books were written at a certain time and place. And there aren't a lot of black characters in the Oz books. And what black characters there are in the Oz books are not ones that we <laughs> really yeah. admire these days. I mean, Ginger is a fine, a fine character, Ginger the slave of the, of the dinner bell. But, you know, slave of the dinner bell is not exactly... Yeah, Thompson the, and slavery and Jinnicky, uh, really hard to ever... <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to make a movie of that in, in quite that way. You know, it might as well be like Song of the South and be banned before it comes out. <laughs> Oh, it's just so unfortunate. Yeah. Um, especially since Jinnicky started out as uh, Arabian Nights sort of, you know. I think maybe for take off. Was watching Thompson, it. Thompson had, you know, this Arabian, she was always going back to old style fairy tales and like recycling the material and trying to make it bring it up to date. And she she obviously loved the Arabian Nights because there's all these like Eastern type characters that she shoved into her Oz books. Mm -hmm. um, and Jinnicky's one of them. But then in Silver Princess, suddenly he has black slaves and it's like, oh God, why? Yeah. <sighs> but. Uh, and not only that, but the black slaves get overthrown. <laughs> Just, just to make it that even that even that little bit worse. <laughs> you don't, yeah, we don't have to talk about that. It doesn't yeah. really have anything to do with witches oh. either. Um, so, but we got into that because of the, the good witch of the uh, West, good witch of the West, Coloma. So John O'Neill did not draw her as a person of African descent, and I thought, well, there's not a lot of Oz people, black people in the Oz books, so. Um, I'm going to make uh, make Gloma look like a person of, of African descent. Um, mm -hmm. I think I first drew her professionally in The Blue Witch of Oz. I drew all the witches in Blue Witch of Oz. And uh, what I did was take a picture. I, I got a picture of Stephanie Mills, her portrait on her home album which was early her early 90s album where she does sing a version of home from the Wiz, really great version i mean it's not that much like her the original broadway uh, cast version which i also love but i love her her 90s version too anyway so i just caught i just um took that use that as reference for gloma and gloma in blue witch is a picture of of uh stephanie mills um Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize that. Dressed as Gloma. That's really neat. That's a detail I didn't know. And do you do you have a theory why we have a good good witch and a bad witch in each of the different four corners of Oz? Um, because it, uh, Baum <laughs> liked it, and then you know he started all these compass witches, and he didn't fill in all of them, so the rest of us did. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Just to kind of start finishing off then, is there a particular witch that you enjoyed illustrating the most? Uh, well, I mean, I, I love all the characters that I illustrate. 
I mean, I don't love every project that I have ever done, but I have to love the characters if I'm going to spend any time with them. Uh, and they're all different, so I love them all for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, Glinda, if we're going to talk about all the witches, we have to include the good witches. So, I mean, I love drawing Glinda. Does when you draw, you know, the, the 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 wicked witches with these exaggerated features, like huge noses or chins or whatever. I love drawing stuff like that. It's fun to draw that, so I love drawing them. Mm -hmm. Singer was fun to draw. My wicked wicked Wick, Wick, witch of the south is fun to draw. Um, it's fun to try to capture uh, drawing the wicked witch of the west trying to capture a Denslow look with this silly little character with pigtails, yet make her look kind of menacing. Mm -hmm. The first time I drew her professionally, I think was in Ice King. Ice King of Oz, one of my mm -hmm. 1980s gra Oz graphic novels. And she had to look a little more menacing and I wanted to make her, I didn't want to draw like this thick, Denslow line and make her look this look like look like a total different style than the rest of the artwork. So I had to sort of morph her into uh, a a style that looked like the style I was using for the book, which is basically naturalistic. Which is a little bit similar, I suppose, to Mordra's style as well. It's not the thick Denslow line art, but it's still yeah, the, the, it's from the Denslow style. Yeah, based on based on that with. The nose, the eye patch, the pigtails, the chin. <laughs> I gave her a lot more wrinkles than Denslow ever gave her, though. Yeah, definitely they're there again with the detailed line art. Oh, my Apple Watch went off. Oops. <laughs> but Mickey Mouse with his red eyes from drinking all night. Yeah, like, good night, pal. <laughs> Just before you go to bed. <laughs> For me, I mean, I, I like all of your illustrations anyway. For me, your work, you are one of the royal illustrators of ours, at least the currently living one as, as of today. Um, Singra particularly is a stunning piece of artwork, and I do thank you for that. But I, I appreciate all your witches of ours. Um, and thank, thank you, you Colin. for just having this chin wag with us on your Wiki Witches and different illustrations. I know that a lot of people will get a kick out of on this, listening to it, and at least it's a good Halloweeny vibe. We'll be discussing witches today. Um, Thank you. I guess we're ending because I just thought of this story about Rachel. Yeah. Rachel Cosgrove pays. When the book came out, published by the Oz Club, um, they asked Rachel to go to all all these Oz conventions. So she did, and she made her own witch costume. Now, this was a woman who 10 years before, um, you know, had people had said, oh, yeah, she, they spoke very uncom uncomplimentary about her um, and that she just wasn't interested in participating or, you know, having anything to do with Oz fans. I mean, her signature line was Oz is for kids and she just couldn't understand why all these adults were running around like, <laughs> enthused about Oz and like trying to figure out why did you write this why did you write that <laughs> um but then when it but when it came right down to it she was right in there with her witch costume um and you know really enthusiastic and uh very personable and you know she getting up on stage <laughs> in this homemade witch costume <laughs> and talking about her book that's great it's it's great to kind of bookend the grouchy perceived Rachel Cosgrove to the one dressed up having a bit of a fun geeky Oz time with everybody else. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And thanks for joining us, Eric. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Happy Halloween, everybody. I will post some links down below where you can see Eric Chanoa's website and some of his work and also Hungry Tiger Press where you can purchase several of Eric's work. Also, some of his non-Oz work, which is, Eric, your main non-Oz work, Age of Bronze. Age Sorry. of Bronze. The words yeah. eluded me. I'm not, I apologize. Um, and also please like and subscribe. And we'll be trying to bring out regular content at least once a fortnight moving forward after October. So 
any like and subscribe really helps the channel out so happy halloween everybody happy halloween eric happy halloween colin thank you so much it was quite a pleasure talking with you today thank you